Okay, so where we where we left off before was we were talking about um, we were talking about the difference between statutory rates, effective rates, and blended rates. Okay? So hopefully it made sense when I said that the statutory rate was the you know the tax rate you would pay on an incremental dollar of income. Okay, statutory rate, rate by law. Effective tax rate, that's the ratio of tax expense to pre-tax income. That's what everyone talks about, okay? Effective tax rate, ETRs, um, get used to that terminology. And then in, sometimes people refer to blended rates. Okay? We didn't cover this before I cut off the last session. And um, blended rates are really just multiple jurisdictions blended into one rate. Okay? And this is uh, pretty straightforward. And you can see a simple example here on the slide where we've taken the federal rate and a state rate, and that state rate is just an arbitrary number just to illustrate. The California rate is higher than that. Um, but other state rates are lower, higher, whatever. Um, but if you are in a state with a 7% tax rate, then your blended rate is really the combination of the federal and the state rates. <coughs> and the added complexity is for every dollar of um, state tax you pay, you get a federal deduction. So when you think of your blended rate, it is really the combination of the federal tax you owe, the state tax you owe, and the federal tax you save because you've paid federal or state tax. Okay? So if people say, I have a blended rate of 38%, that just means their federal and state rate net of the federal deduction. That would be typical. Okay? We won't talk too much about blended rates. We will talk about effective rates. That will be the focus of our conversation. Okay? <coughs> Okay, so through the course, you will find, um, through the first four classes, we're going to cover um, a sequence of materials that are framed around these ten steps. Okay? And the goal is, and this is where we're trying a new format in this year's class, but the goal is to be very deliberate in how we go through the steps of calculating a provision so you understand from beginning to end how to get it done. Okay? Um, <coughs> So I will often have this page as a header to a section, but you'll see that we'll hit steps one and two, or three and four, and it will be structured that way. So this is almost your index to the next three and a half classes, okay? Okay, <coughs> some key basics. Okay. You'll see we're gonna play a game here in a second, but um, <coughs> we're gonna do some basics to start with. <coughs> I always think the provisions are so hard to learn just from listening to somebody or words. But So there's only two slides like this, and then we'll get into problems, and we'll do things that are a little more hands-on. But again, these are some of the key themes. Okay? The first bullet, account for consequences in the period it's recognized for financial statements. That's that matching thing I talked about, right? So if you're getting lost and you're in the weeds of a problem, think matching, right? How do I do something where I'm matching my tax effects with my pre-tax um, uh, accounting? The second bullet, compute provisions by jurisdictions, okay? So somebody asked, I think you asked about international taxes or uh, somebody other than federal. So when you go to a big company, um, like the guys in the back were telling me that they work for NetApp, right? We'll use you guys already as an example. So Network Appliance is big technology storage company, right? They do business all over the world, although I know like nothing about your provision, but I know enough that you do stuff around the world. When they compute their tax provision, they do it by jurisdiction, okay? They don't do the world at once. You know, they will look at um, Mexico and calculate their Mexico provision. Then they will move to, you know, you know, Korea and do their Korean provision. And they'll just go down the list of all the foreign entities that they have in the U.S. and the states, and they'll add it all up. And that will be their global consolidated provision. Okay? So you do it by jurisdiction. In fact, when I, um, when I go up and spend time at Amazon, they have a schedule that just consolidates all their jurisdictions, and you can just hold the like, go right arrow button down, and it's just like, you know, and just goes on and on and on. Um, but you have to keep in mind that even though they have a lot of columns, it's nothing more than a lot of columns. So they go through the same process for one jurisdiction as the next. And so that doesn't mean because there's a lot, it's complex. It just means it's voluminous. So again, remember how I said earlier, if you get stuck on something, break it down into a small component. Well, if the NetApp provision is overwhelming for you, don't worry about it. Think about the NetApp Mexico provision. I'll bet it's pretty straightforward. 
and then go into the career provision. I'll bet you can handle that, right? And then you just kind of build things up piece by piece and it'll all come together. Okay? But the key is jurisdiction by jurisdiction. You don't do the world at one time. The third bullet we'll get to in class three, and uh, it's a bunch of terminology that is too early to cover in this class, honestly, so just hold the thought. Um, the last two bullets we will cover through the examples. I think it'll be easier. Deferred taxes. So raise your hand if you are familiar with deferred taxes and could explain, like if I asked you to define it and I called you right now, you could answer me. Raise your hand if you could do that. Really? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> so deferred taxes then, we'll, we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about this today. Um, you will recognize a deferred tax asset <coughs> for something that is deductible in the future that will save you tax. Okay. So. Take a simple example, bad debt reserves. Okay? <coughs> when a company accrues a bad debt reserve for book purposes, they accrue it based on an estimate of people that are not going to pay. Right? It is a guess. So when is that deductible for tax? When it's actually incurred. No, when you write it off. When you write, when when you write it off, right? So it is deductible in the future. Books expenses it based on an estimate. Tax deducts it in the future. That future deduction you know you're going to get because you can see the book expense that's foretelling it, you will record that anticipated deduction today by way of booking a deferred tax asset. You will say, books told me there's something bad going on here. Anytime I lose money, that's going to save me tax. So that's a good thing for tax. So I'm going to book that deferred tax asset today because I know a tax deduction is coming. It's just a matter of time. Okay? That is a deferred tax asset. A deferred tax liability is like that Mr. Big Bucks example thing we went through, right? We're sitting on something that's kind of a time bomb for taxes. And there might need to be some future event that triggers that tax liability, but that, the fact that there is a liability, it exists today, right? We knew that we had a basis in our asset that was much lower for tax than books, so that's a liability that's just waiting to be triggered. So we booked that liability because it's a future tax obligation. Okay, we're not going to put it on our return yet, but we know economically it exists. Okay, that's what the DTL is for. And the last bullet, when you book deferred taxes, you don't guess at what tax rates are going to be. You book them at the rates they are now. Right? So if you think Romney's going to win, tax rates might go down. Right? You don't factor that in. You just book at 35%. Um, who knows what's going to happen. Right? So you book at today's enacted rates. Um, the top upper right, okay, so let's use um, that bad debt reserve example. So you have a company that's expensed a uh, bad debt reserve. They said, I don't think a customer is going to pay. You as the tax person would say, that's great. I'm going to get a future deduction. I want to book me a nice big asset. Tell the reader of the financials I'm going to save tax. Well, if you're a company that's been losing money since the beginning of time and have little prospects of making money, you're not saving any tax, right? <laughs> you have no tax. So it wouldn't make sense for you to say, hey, reader, I'm going to save a bunch of tax on this bad debt reserve. Because the reader would be like, what tax are you talking about? This is not a helpful thing for me. So when you have deferred tax assets, but they're not worth anything, you book a valuation allowance against them. Okay? An valuation allowance, this might be confusing, but a ba valuation allowance is like a bad debt reserve for tax accounts. Right? When you have a receivable and you don't think somebody's going to pay, you book the receivable and you book a reserve against it. When you have a tax asset that may not be worth anything, you book the tax asset and you offset it with a valuation allowance. It's What's like that entry? Valuation entry. Sorry, one more time. So that, that's a credit to the valuation and the debit is? Um, the debit would be expense usually. Yeah. Well, we'll get to the journal entries behind a valuation allowance later. But know that what a valuation allowance stands for is not every asset is worth something. So when you're trying to explain to the reader, is this asset something that you should count on as a, an asset like any other? Well, you would put a valuation allowance on to the extent that assets should be discounted. Okay? 
the, the bottom right hand corner um, to determine if there's an exception to temporary differences you guys asked about like why Google's rate is so low that is the reason no one would ever articulate it that way they wouldn't say my rate is 4% because I've determined that I have an exception applying to my temporary difference but that that's at the heart of it yeah you will find that um, so I'll give you a so the question was if you have deferred taxes that won't reverse for a long period of time do you book it at an absolute dollar number or do you discount it and the answer is you book it at absolute dollars and you will see that through some of the examples we'll read in 10Ks. You will find that um, one of your homework assignments will be to find a company with the world's biggest valuation allowance. And uh, <laughs> you will see that uh, when you find that company, um, like giving it away, now you have like a couple weeks to get that right. Um, but when you find that company, you'll see that they have um, deferred tax assets that won't reverse for a long time but they record them at the absolute dollar value. It's very clear. So that's it. So what I mean by this um, bottom right-hand corner, so I'll just kind of give you a window into it because usually people are really interested in this. So take, for example, um, really a lot of high-tech companies. I mean, I'm not going to personalize it to anyone, but take a company that has a U.S. parent and a foreign sub, okay? And let's say that this foreign sub has a 0% tax rate, okay? So if you're this company, where are you gonna try to put all your profits? In that foreign? Foreign sub, right? Duh, okay? So <clears throat> if you put all your profits in here, let's say you make $100, mm -hmm. and let's say you're able to keep them there, okay? So you're not going to have a tax expense, right? Foreign country has no tax rate. You make all your money in that foreign tax uh, jurisdiction. So your effective tax rate is zero, right? So what would happen if you paid a dividend from that foreign sub up to the U.S. parent then, right? So if you pay a dividend up to the U.S., what is the U.S. going to do? Tax it. Tax it, right? So you will have to pay 35 of tax. So now your tax rate <coughs> is no longer zero, right? It is 35%. So if you're like a lot of big tech companies in the Valley, you have a lot of money um, tied up in, gosh, like inadvertently hit buttons on this thing. You have a lot of money tied up in your foreign subs. And <coughs> what you're doing is you're not paying that dividend, right? Because you realize that it has the natural effect of causing you to pay a lot of tax. And in fact, um, if you, uh, you saw the 60 Minutes episode with um, uh, John Chambers from Cisco, all he talked about was that fact. He's like, the U.S. is anti-competitive, it has a really high tax rate, Cisco has a lot of money offshore, they don't repatriate, really because they don't want to pay the 35% tax rate, and um, it was just signaling the, the political debate around what the tax structure ought to be, right? So if you think accrual accounting, remember I said you should be expensing the tax you owe today and the tax you owe in the future. Well, you would expect that at some point the company's going to owe that tax in the future, right? They're going to bring the money back. They can't leave it there forever. And so the question would be, well, why don't they have to accrue that tax now, right? Why don't they have to book the U.S. tax today to match it with today's earnings, right? Because we talked about matching. And, <coughs> and this, ex this um, exception that we were just talking about a second ago, down here in this bullet, this allows them to not book that tax anticipating the dividend. Okay? This basically says if you're leaving your money offshore, you don't have to book that tax that would exist if you did bring your money onshore, okay? 
and that is the single biggest lever companies have to move their effective tax rates up and down, right? They put money offshore at low rates, and they keep money offshore at low rates. And there's no need for you to book that tax as long as you satisfy a bunch of requirements and your facts support the situation. But you will see that that is why tax rates get low. And it's a little cryptic from reading the slide, but that is what the slide is telling you. Okay. We'll talk more about it in the, uh, the last class in the semester. We'll talk about um, international taxes. We'll go into that in a lot of detail. So, can I ask a question? Can you ask a question? Of course you can. So if you have a net loss in a year or you anticipate it, can you bring back the dividends in that year? So the question was, if you have a loss in the year, can you bring back your foreign dividends um, to offset that loss? And the answer is maybe, probably, depends. Um, it gets more complicated. Yeah. It depends is always a great way to answer any question. Yeah. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to play a little game and we're going to teach you guys about uh, permanent differences and temporary differences. And this is also going to be my way of uh, meeting you guys to some extent. So you will find, like I said earlier, I want to know your names. I want to know you guys. And um, that will help me punish you later in the course as I <laughs> call on you. So I'm going to pause the video because this is not going to be uh, entertainment worthy, I think, for people to watch on replay. Um, there's no difference between software, you get the expense and on books and also on tax, right? Okay. <laughs> What I can't tell is whether we're recording or not, unfortunately. Looks like yes, but the screen isn't doing its screen thing, which makes me nervous. All right, well, we'll just see if it's uh, going. Anyways, <clears throat> okay, so that was Family Feud. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try to get to know all your names, and usually I do a pretty good job. Um, uh, I'm totally off my game with the whole foot thing, but uh, I will work on it. I guarantee you, some of you I will struggle with. If you haven't noticed, there are a lot of women with dark hair, and um, <laughs> that that's always the hardest one. Um, but yeah, be patient, and I will uh, I will learn. Yeah, your funny like personal comments helps me. Um, okay, so what we learned through. The, um, the game is that there are permanent differences and temporary differences, okay? So there was some educational value to that. And it's important that you understand the difference between permanent items and temporary differences because permanent items, as a general matter, change the amount of your expense, right? And therefore, they impact your effective tax rate. So everything that was on the game board for items that impact your effective tax rate they are all permanent differences. They all change permanently how much tax you will pay, whether it's more or less. Okay? And remember that if your provision is the sum of the tax you'll pay today and in the future, if you're going to pay over the you know, infinite amount of period of time that you're looking more or less, it is because of something that is permanently increasing or decreasing that tax. Okay? So you need to be able to think when you hear something is that something that permanently impacts my tax liability, makes it go up or down, or is that just a temporary item? You know, it changes it one year, but it'll reverse the next. Okay? So you need to, it's very important to identify what's permanent versus what's temporary. So types of permanent differences, as you can see from slide 28 here, tax-exempt interest, fines, penalties, meals, entertainments, credits, um, all those things are permanent differences, right? Nothing is reversing. One of the frustrating things that you'll find about reading the guidance that um, will be your homework assignment <coughs> is oftentimes basic things like what a permanent difference is is not described in ASC 740. Like you would just expect, wouldn't it call out a permanent differences and talk to it? It, just, it doesn't. So um, know that when you do the reading, um, expect it to not be very easy. 
it, um, I find reading AAC 740 is like choppy, um, not great for a student who doesn't really know kind of or have a lot of context to put reading into. Um, and what I would suggest, and uh, I can't force you to do this, but what I would suggest is read things multiple times. Okay? When I was uh, taking my master's in tax classes back when I had a total full head of hair, um, <laughs> the teacher that I will always remember, he used to always say, read with the um, precision of a laser and the speed of a glacier. That was like his big catchphrase. <laughs> Super corny. Um, but totally accurate. Slow, steady, read it multiple times. I get it if you read it and you're like, I didn't understand it. So my advice to you if I was sitting next to you and you, you were having that feeling was read it again. Okay? The, the way you will learn is just by getting over those uncomfortable moments and just continuing to try. Okay? <coughs> Okay, and so the last bullet, permanent items impact our total tax expense and the effective tax rate. Temporary differences. Book and tax is different, right? Things happen in different periods. So the key for temporary differences is, and you have to think of this as a, as a balance sheet concept, is this guy right here. Okay. If you have an asset or a liability where the book basis is one number and the tax basis is another number, you have a temporary difference. Okay? So let's keep using the bad debt reserve example because we've been using that a fair amount in the class so far. Company sells something for 100 bucks, they expect a the customer to pay them 100 bucks. Okay? Tax guys, you pick up $100 of income, you're expecting $100 of payment too. Okay? Your basis in that receivable for book and tax is both 100, right? You have both picked up 100 of income. You both have an asset for $100, okay? So at that point, your basis is the same. There is no difference. Next thing that happens is book says, okay, I don't know if this guy's gonna pay. I'm gonna book a $10 reserve just based on me, you know, taking his swag at whether he'll pay or not, okay? Books basically writes down the 100 of receivable to 90 and said, if I had to put some odds on this thing, I don't know if he'll pay or not, but I'm like 90% confident when I look at this person, as part of a pool of a lot of people, that I'm gonna collect on this receivable. So books basically writes down the basis of the asset to 90. What is your tax basis in the receivable? 100. 100, it hasn't changed, right? Just because books, books are reserved, nothing happens for tax. So now you have an asset, your, your receivable, your book basis is 90, your tax basis is 100, right? Okay, now think, what would happen if you sold that receivable to Timmy for book value? What would happen? For 90? Book value. Jamie, what would happen if you sold your receivable to Timmy for 90 bucks book value? You're the only I Jamie. Said, I said Jamie. No. <laughs> Jamie with an M. With an M. With an M. <laughs> <laughs> What's Jamie? Technicality. Jamie from Russia with a crazy yeah. family. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen? What would happen on your tax return if you sold your receivable to Timmy for $90? Mm. Not a trick question. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be in a loss. What kind of loss is that? What would happen? You would get a tax deduction, right? Yeah. So for book purposes, you'd have no gain or loss, right? You had a receivable with a basis of 90. You sell it to Timmy for 90 of cash, and all you do on your book balance sheet is exchange one asset worth 90 for another asset worth 90. It's like nothing happened. But for tax, you sold an asset for 90, but you had a tax basis of 100. So you get a deduction, right? So that deduction arises because you closed the basis difference in the asset. So you should always think, do I have an asset or liability with a basis difference? Yes or no. And if I sold that asset or um, you know, closed out the liability, for the book value amount, do I get a deduction or I pick up income? If you get a deduction, then it's a deferred tax asset. 
if you would pick up income, then it's a deferred tax liability. Okay. So in addition to thinking as a temporary difference as, you know, I have a difference in one year that will reverse in the next, because that's a good way to think about temporary differences. Also think about it as, I could go through my balance sheet and everything on it, I could put my book basis next to my tax basis. And if there's a difference in any account, that difference will give rise to a deferred tax asset or liability. And the way to fictionalize it is, what would happen if I basically sold everything on my balance sheet for cash equal to book value? When you get lost in the theory of deferreds, think, what would happen if I sold my balance sheet for cash equal to book value? That will tell you the answer. Okay? I think it's easy when you think like bad debt reserves because it's kind of intuitive. But when you start thinking of like a warranty reserve, right? Now it's a liability. It seems weird. Everything's kind of flipped around. But if you basically settled a warranty reserve, let's say you had a warranty reserve for 60 bucks on your books. If you paid cash to make that liability go away, what would happen? You would get a deduction, right? Because warranties are deductible when paid. So you have a difference. In the future, when you close out your balance sheet for cash equal to book value, you would have um, a deduction. So that's a deferred tax asset. Okay? And oftentimes, you will hear the phrase uh, tax basis balance sheet, okay? And what people mean is they take their book balance sheet and they do it all again. And instead of using book numbers, they use tax basis numbers. So they'd say, well, what's my tax basis in receivables? What's my tax basis in inventory? What's my tax basis in equipment? And they would just take the entire balance sheet and they would put it on a tax basis. And when you compare your book basis balance sheet to your tax basis balance sheet, all your deferreds will fall out of that. But if you can think from a simple perspective, do I have, think of it two ways. One is, do I have book tax differences that go one way in year one and flip the other way in year two? That's a temporary item. Or a completely different way of thinking about it, but you get to the same thing is, do I have an asset or liability on the balance sheet where my basis for book and tax is different? And what would happen if I sold that asset or liability for cash? We get it. <clears throat> when you think of temporary differences, do you think of um, do you think there are more DTAs or DTLs if you just polled companies? DTAs, DTAs right? Yeah, lots more DTAs because books <coughs> books tries to anticipate things, right? They're a cruel accounting. Tax law is not a cruel accounting even if you check the box on your tax return that you're an accrual method taxpayer. You know, for stock comp, you've got to wait till it's paid, right? Um, you know, for liabilities that don't pass, you know, an all events test, even though books accrue them, tax has to wait to deduct them, right? Sometimes books will use short lives for assets, but tax takes a longer time. So there's all sorts of reasons in tax law that the tax deduction comes later than the book expense. And so it is heavily weighted towards deferred tax assets than deferred tax liabilities. Okay, we will learn more about this next class. Next class we will do um, a, you know, fairly exhaustive how do you get from book income to taxable income and all the stuff that falls out. But I want you to at least start thinking about permanent temp items. <clears throat> Question. The difference between book income um, book balance sheet and tax balance sheet is M1, isn't it? Well, the difference to, to get from book income to taxable income is now on the Schedule M3 for most companies, but it's the same thing as an M1. And so Schedule M's, for especially for the students who may not be familiar with this, is the Schedule M1 is just the schedule that takes you from your book income to taxable income and explains why it's different. What are all the items that are you know, different between book and tax. And so that would be a great place to look for your permanent and temporary differences because those are your differences. Um, they won't necessarily tell you what your cumulative differences are, but they'll tell you what the current year differences are. Okay? And that'll make more sense as we go through class. I know that sounds a little abstract.
Okay. Okay, so we're going to do some basic examples. And my hope is that some of you have an aha moment as to, like, oh, now I get how this comes together. Okay? And this is um, about as basic as it gets, but that's totally fine. You need to think in, do I understand the theory? Okay, so the next few examples are all about theory and how we're going to apply theory to a, a set of facts. Okay? And remember what I said about step one, step two, step three, right? Because we're going to be applying that theory. Okay, so we're going to use this little template I talked about and um, go through some simple examples. Example one, so you have book income of $500,000. You have no temporary or permanent differences and your statutory rate is 40%. Okay? So if you were thinking of a journal entry that um, you could book from this set of facts, and you were going to do step one, step two, step three, right? <coughs> what was step one? Susie, what was step one? I think it was figure out your tax in the current year. Figure out your tax. How much is your tax, Susie? 200K. 200K. So if you were going to book an entry for a 200K tax that you owe, would that be a debit or a credit? Sorry, it would be a debit to expense and I would credit the liability. Okay, so let's just focus on the liability. Okay, so we are going to credit the liability for 200K. Okay? So, step two. Amanda, what was step two? Determine your deferred taxes, right? Do we have deferred taxes? No, right? We made the facts really basic. So if we don't have deferred taxes, what happens? What pops out? Provision. Your provision, right? <coughs> so there's a debit to tax expense of 200000 right? So I want you to be thinking of journal entries that remember in a single row, they balance. And so, this same thing illustrates what we were just talking about, right? We have a journal entry that balances here. <coughs> and we've booked our payable of 200000 And we've booked no deferreds. And our <coughs> offsetting entry to balance the entry is a current tax expense of 200000 Okay? So, Lewis, how would I calculate my effective tax rate? Uh, you take the uh, income, tax, income tax expense divided by the uh, income for tax. Okay, so my income tax expense was 500000 My before tax income was 500000 So my effective tax rate was 40%, right? That's pretty easy. It helps when there's no differences. Okay? That's it does not get easier than that. Okay. Example two. Same facts, five hundred thousand of income. We have no temporary differences, but this time we have a permanent difference. Okay. We have a permanent difference related to meals and entertainment of thirty thousand. So I think you should assume that half of that is deductible. And you should likewise assume that the 30000 of deduction is already reflected, or the book expense of 30000 is already in the 500000 of income. Okay? Gamma. Yes. What would be our uh, tax liability for the year? How would you calculate that? Think taxable income first. So you start with book income of five hundred thousand, right? So we're going to have five hundred thousand of our PBT. What are we going to do to our five hundred thousand to get to taxable income? We're going to do what? We're going to what about meals and entertainment? What are we going to do with it?
we're going to say 50% of that is deductible, right? Mm -hmm. So that means to our 500,000, we probably have to add 15,000 back, right? Because in the 500,000 is 30,000 of book expense. But if 15,000 of it is non-deductible, we need to add it back. So our taxable income is 515, right? And our tax rate is 40%. So we have tax of 206. All right? That makes sense to you, Gamma? Yes, it does. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, Jesse. Sorry, I said the name, had to look for the person that looked up. <laughs> I'll use any strategy that works. Okay, so Jesse, if you were trying to think of a, of a journal entry to book for this, what would you do? What would you start? What is step one? You have to talk louder, they can never hear you. Tax is payable. Tax is payable. Okay. You're going to book a debit or credit to that? You're going to book a tax credit or a credit to your taxes payable, right? For 206. Okay, what was what step two? Uh, deferreds. Defer Do we have any deferreds? No. no. Okay, so Chloe, what happens next? You said it right, but no one could hear you but like three of us. Mm -hmm. That makes five of us now. <laughs> you can do it. Um, provision. provision, yeah. So we're going to balance our entry with a debit to tax expense of 200 or 206, right? So on this slide, I've shown it as two separate entries. So you could do it both ways. You could do the whole thing as step one, <coughs> step two, step three, like we just did, or you could break it down individ individual entries if that made more sense to you. Gets to the same place. Not everyone does the provision the same way. You could do it both ways and know that you got to the same place. You could do it one way and just be confident in that. I don't care. Whatever works for you. Okay? <coughs> um, Rohan. What's our effective tax rate? Or how do you come up with it? Our effective tax rate is our 206 divided by 500, right? Our expense divided by pre-tax income. So what's that? That's like 41%, right? Right? Everyone good with that? Win June. I feel like calling you Uncle Sam from here on out. <laughs> I have to say, it's going to be hard for me to let that go. <laughs> you okay if we call you Uncle Sam? <laughs> no? <laughs> so, when June, um, why did the effective tax rate change? Right, so I, I'm the CFO and I come to you, I'm like, what's up? Our effective tax rate went up. That's not good. I told you to make it lower. Why is it higher? So what do you say to him or her? Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you would say it's a permanent difference, right? And that type of an expense, the government does not approve of, so they only let you deduct some of it. So the fact that you can't deduct all of it, that hurts your tax expense, right? You're going to permanently pay more tax. So you would say, if you were trying to like be glass half full, you would say, hey, you might want to you know, be more like Google and put all your earnings offshore and lower your tax rate and <laughs> eat less, right? <laughs> um, 
But you want to explain to him or her that this is a permanent item, and to the extent you've permanently changed the amount of tax you owe, then that affects your effective tax rate, right? Trust me that there is a skill <laughs> to dealing with a non-tax person who's questioning your effective tax rate. It will help you to find a positive to put with the negative, right? Uh, you don't have to do that in this class, but it's kind of like, you know, if a student does really poorly, I'll be like, I really like your shirt, that's nice, where did you go? <laughs> but you don't know what you're doing, right? So um, when you're dealing with effective tax rate type of communications, think about that. I know it's a completely, you know, non-technical point, but just know that's, that kind of stuff is important. Amanda. Yeah, so Amanda's question was, I think, do CFOs, are they, you know, um, are they very knowledgeable about how a tax provision works? No, the answer is no, definitely not. No, no. No. They have a lot of things going on. I mean, to their credit or in fairness to them, I don't understand most of what they do and they don't understand what I do. So, I mean, they're very reliant on you guys to know what you're doing and not only to get it right, but to be able to communicate it. The communication is key. I'm curious. Is is I know meals and uh, is only half deductible, but Google basically provides an employee benefit of free food and lunch. Is that meals? Is that or is that is that that's hundred percent deductible? That is beyond the scope of this class. <laughs> I would not like to talk about that topic. I can ask. Pardon? A lot of companies have free cafeterias. That's tricky. There's a lot of issues with that. Um, it's better that we just talk about like one employee takes another employee out to dinner or something like that, or you take a person out to like lure them to buy your product or something. That's your typical meals and entertainment. That's easier. Um. <coughs> Okay, so Shadi's question was, why do you divide by 500 instead of 515? And the, and the answer is, your effective tax rate is the percentage of your book income that you have as a tax expense. So it's not your percentage of taxable income, it's your percentage of book income. So we want to know on a book basis what percentage of every dollar of book income you make that you're going to now pay in tax. That's a good question. I got a question. When you're reading the Nordstrom's um, 10K, they had um, net profit after net profit before tax, and they had net booking. They had several derivatives of income, and, and it confused me. I remember net income as net income. But there were several derivatives of it. One was the tax was 536, and then it was 501. I'll flip to the Nordstrom's 10K at the end of class. We'll go through it a little bit, and then I, I can help you see what to look for for intuitive, because I want you guys to be able to pick a part of a financial statement a bit and understand what questions to ask. Okay. All right, example three. Um, Caitlin. We have book income of 500000 an increase of 200000 related to accrued vacation. Okay. You could cheat with your friends, too. I, you don't have a ton of experience, I don't think. You could cheat with your friends on both sides. Um, <coughs> we have accrued vacation increased by 200000 We have the same meals and entertainment of 30000 So it's getting slightly harder. Right? We have a few things going on now. But all we've done is really add one more fact. Okay? So if we were going to do step one and come up with our tax liability, how would we do it, Caitlin? Okay, we're going to start with book income of 500000 right? We already talked about how we're going to add back 15000 for the meals and entertainment. Okay? Accrued vacation. So for book purposes, you accrue it when they earn it. 
For tax, you deduct it when you pay it. Okay? Let's say they've earned it, hasn't been paid. That's why it's accrued. What? You're going to add it back, right? Because the 200000 is expensed with in-book income, but it's not deductible yet. Okay? So we are going to add it back, 200000 so our taxable income, 715, right? Our tax rate is 40%, so that is 286. Mm -hmm. Heidi. I know. <laughs> I was looking for my notes. Um, okay, so Heidi, we just figured out that our tax liability was 286. Okay, so if I'm doing step one, I'm, I need to do a journal entry. I'm going to debit or credit taxes payable. Credit, right? Okay, so I'm going to credit taxes payable uh, 286, right? Okay, now Heidi, do I have deferred taxes? <laughs> it's one or the other. I would go with the first answer. That's usually the right way to go. Yes. Right, so we have deferred taxes. What are our deferred taxes? Fang. What are our deferred taxes? Is it Fang or Fong? Fong. Okay. Sorry. You might have to answer to Fang, too. <laughs> <laughs> what are our deferred taxes? Okay, we did step one. We calculated how much tax we owe today. Now we're going to figure out how much tax are we going to owe or save in the future. Okay? Don't try to answer. Think process, right? If I'm trying to figure out if I have deferred taxes, the first thing I've got to do is figure out if I have temporary differences. Right? Do I have a temporary difference? Yes. Yes. What is that? Uh, Think. If you sold your balance sheet for cash, and in this example, you might have to pay somebody to assume your accrued vacation liability, right? If you paid somebody to assume your vacation liability, what would happen? You would save tax, right? Mm -hmm. If you said to Amanda, hey, I'm going to pay you 200 bucks, and then you just pay this other person when it comes time, it's like you're my payroll agent or something, mm -hmm. you would get a deduction, right? You paid your liability. Okay? <coughs> so if you pay a deduction or pay a liability that creates a deduction, then you have a deferred tax mm -hmm. asset, right? You are going to save money in the future when this liability gets paid, right? <coughs> So is that a um, debit or a credit? Debit. Debit. So we are going to debit our deferred tax asset. How much tax are we going to save, Mike? 80. 80. Okay. Andy. Dating website, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so great. What uh, What do we do next? Plug in. Plug in your provision, right? You got to balance your entry. So, do I debit or credit this thing? Debit. Okay. <coughs> okay, I'm going to debit my provision for two oh six, right? So, <coughs> this the template here does it a little bit differently, um, but you get to the exact same answer. So, we booked our original entry, which was payable and expense. 
Then we said meals and entertainment, that's permanent. So it affects our payable, hits our expense. There's no deferreds at this point. Now we say, well look, we're gonna owe 80,000 more this year because of accrued vacation, but next year we'll get it back. We'll get a deduction next year. We'll save tax next year. So that is a credit, that is a debit, and essentially the expense on a whole nets to zero, right? So that doesn't affect our total provision expense. You've seen how I've broken out our expense between a current expense and a deferred expense, but for the moment think total expense. Total expense did not change because I had a timing difference. Okay. <clears throat> so Michael, what is our effective tax rate? Uh, oh, we got two. Oh, okay, you're Mike. He's Michael. Oh, okay. Sorry. No problem. That, that, that'll be our uh, 286 over 500. Okay. Who else thinks something different besides Michael? I think it's 206, right? It's 41. That I haven't picked on before. Tell me your name one more time, please. The, the lady man. Lady man. <laughs> <laughs> it's better that you said that than me. Uh, the effective tax rate is two hundred six over five hundred. Right. The effective tax rate is still two hundred six over five hundred. Right. Because our total expense is two hundred six still. So our effective tax rate. 41 percent. Okay. What was our effective tax rate in example two? <coughs> Same. Same. Right? Jing, what do you take from this? Meaning, what is like the net message I'm trying to send here with these three examples? No, the Jing in front of you. <laughs> Free tax income doesn't change, that is true. <laughs> you get the Bill Clinton Award for tonight. <laughs> Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me your name behind Jing, sorry. Jenny. Jenny. Jenny, Jean, Jesse. <laughs> Do you see how hard this is? Yeah. <laughs> see? Okay. Jenny. Okay. In addition to pre-tax income not changing between the three examples, what other message am I trying to send? Like, what is the takeaway here? Temporary items don't change your Yes, right? Temporary differences don't impact my effective tax rate. They might change when I pay tax, mm -hmm. but they don't change whether I pay tax. Right? That is key. Yeah, so it's weird. You could have like a you know a pretty good effective tax rate with all these temporary differences, but your cash flow might be different because you might be paying it all right away in taxes. And recouping later. Right. Does everyone get before I go into that, does everyone get that permanent items impact your tax rate? Make it go up or down? Temporary items, not so much, right? They move the balance sheet around. You might owe more payable. You might have DTAs. Could go the other way, right? You could save tax this year, pay a lot less this year, but you might owe more in the future. Um, can kind of go all over the place, but it doesn't change your effective tax rate. It doesn't change your provision expense, okay? <coughs> Shung. What do you think our CFO cares about? Does he care about perm items or temporary items? Perm items, right? Perm items rule the day, right? Because normally, I mean, this isn't the case with everybody, but most, especially the Silicon Valley type companies, they're all P&L based, right? They're all trying to show the highest earnings per share they can possibly show. And the way to do that is to lower your effective tax rate, at least the part that's within your control. 
lower your effective tax rate because that will raise net income, it'll raise earnings per share. So you got to think twofold, right? You got two things you got to be thinking about. One is as you're doing a provision, you got to make sure that when you're calculating a provision that you can go line by line and tell the story. What are my journal entries? Right? And for every line, do a step one, two, and three. How does this affect my payable? How does it affect my deferreds? Let the provision come out. Next line, how does it affect my payable? How does it affect my deferreds? Let the provision come out, right? You can just sit there and do it over and over again, right? You work for NetApp, they got lots of rows. You could break it out into a zillion rows if you wanted to. If, if like you could not figure it out, that is how you could do it. You could break it down to the smallest component possible. No one does it that way, but if you get stuck, especially you guys in class, that's how I would do it. Break it down to like the smallest absolute element, make a balanced journal entry out of it, add it to the next element. Okay? So A, you got to get it right, but then B, as you think of, well, how do I use this in practice? Well, now you should take away, gosh, permanent items impact my effective rate. My boss cares about effective rate. I should really understand more about those uh, permanent items because that's, that's more impactful than temporary items. Right? If I go out and talk to a client, like if I go talk to Tracy about intuitive surgical stuff, I guarantee you they want to hear about permanent differences. They don't want to talk about temporary differences. They, like I told you, their whole balance sheet is cash. The cash flow to them, not a big deal. Um, they want to talk about rate, income statement, P&L benefit. Okay, you get that? So Lena's question is, what happens if you don't pay all 200 of the vacation? What, hap what happens if you pay like 125 of it, right? Is that your question? Well, it depends. Um, if you don't pay the 200 next year, let's say you pay 125 next year and you pay 75 the year after that, then you get deductions over two years instead of one year. Um, if book says, you know what, I never even owed 200, I just totally overestimated, books will reverse that expense through income and you'll have a difference going the other way. That's a little tricky, I don't want to confuse people with that one, but it will all work out. And what you need to do is sit there and go line by line and say, what did books do? What's the corresponding tax treatment? Because if books reverses the liability, that's not taxable income, right? It's kind of a nothing for tax. But for now, think simpler examples. Don't confuse yourself too much with the facts, because I can tell in some of your faces, you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So um, think of like simpler examples and try to apply the, the ASC 740 mechanics. Okay, pretty important that you understand those three examples and kind of the takeaway from that. So, does anyone want to talk about it at all? I, I'm lost. I'm sorry. I mean, to, 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 to stop you, but it's 206 over 500. That's 41 percent for the for the for the vacation accrual. Or the fact is, is if you put the vacation accrual in, you would uh, it would be. Um, 286 over 500. Right, but the 286 is not your expense. The 206 is your expense. Two, two, but it, the 286 would be my expense it, eventually because it's a, it's a timing issue. It's in your payables, the 286. But, it, but, the is two, but the expense is, is 286, isn't it? I mean, eventually. No. The provision is 206. The, the, provision, the, the, the provision is... Your provision is the... 286 right here netted with the 80 right here. Your total expense is the 206. It is the same number. I, I understand that, but my, my point is what I don't understand is you saying that the timing difference doesn't hit my effective rate. For that particular year, it does. Because it basically puts 80,000 80, in the subsequent year. Right. What happens with the timing difference is 
it increases your payable, which is a credit, and it increases your deferred asset, which is an asset. It has no impact on your P&L. So when you have a timing difference, it moves the balance sheet, but it does not move the P&L. That's what we're trying to explain. It's fine if it doesn't like come across totally clearly. But you owe the tax man 286. You owe the tax man 286 now. That's not your expense. Your expense is what is the tax you're ever going to pay on that 500 of income? And over the life of, of this company, it'll be 206. 286 is just a moment in time. 206 is what you will ultimately ever pay. Okay? Okay. Sorry, can you repeat the last thing? Maybe the amount that you will ultimately pay is the 206? Okay. 286. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so 286 is what you'll pay today. 286 or 206? 286 is what you're going to pay currently, but in the future you'll save 80. Because you're going to get the expense later on. You'll get that tax deduction later, so that means cumulatively you'll pay 206. Don't okay. worry about annual carrybacks and that kind of stuff. Just assume it all works out. Okay? Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> all right, it's 9.30. I'm having fun. Um, so um, a couple things. Homework. So uh, every class we're going to have a little homework page like this that will have your homework assignment. And um, we're not done yet. Don't pack up. I, but I do want to kind of tee up the homework discussion. Reading. You have reading to do, which is both out of the FASB guidance that's, that reading right there, that first bullet, that's probably six pages, okay? If I were you, I would read it like four times. It's super important stuff. Read it a bunch of times, it's not very long. If you take an hour, t you know, on two different days between now and next week, that's plenty of time to read that stuff. Um, read our roadmap, it says some of the same stuff using different words. So if you read the first thing and you're like, man, that was horrible, read the second thing and see if that helps. Okay. Don't be one of those people that um, so many times I, I see people that learn provisions just from like, well, you know, like, I'm Rochelle, I work with Janie. Well, Janie does it this way, so that's how I learned to do it. And I don't know why Janie does it that way, but that's how I learned. <laughs> right? That is very commonplace in the provision world. That's pretty bad, right? You, that's not the way you want to learn. Read, right? Take notes. Challenge your own understanding. Understand why you do things. So re do the reading. A lot of you will like get tired and not do the reading, and I would say you're totally cheating yourselves. It's a bad idea. Okay, um, next thing. Read the intuitive surgical 10K. And we're going to flip through the Nordstrom's one a bit just to show you like what I would do if I was looking at it. And, um, but I want you to read that 10K and come with questions. They're a calendar year end company, so their 10K was filed like seven months ago. So it's just sitting on the web waiting for you. And um, read about it. Understand the company a little bit. See what their taxes look like. And um, see what you can figure out. But come with some intelligent questions, because I'm not going to run the show with, uh, with Tracy. Um, you guys are. Um, and actually, Tracy has a manager she works with um, whose name is Carol. And Carol took my class a year or two ago, and she's going to come too. So she'll be like an alum from the class who now is living the real, the dream, you know? <laughs> it's like the whole cycle of life. The dream. <laughs> Carol's, I mean, they're both like sweethearts, so um, you will like them. Okay, and then homework assignment number one. So that is a, um, uh, something that Anna will email out to you guys, which is a couple pages of stuff. And I want you to do like simple problems, answer questions, and um, you will turn that in. I don't think this is recording, honestly. This is not great. Um, okay. So, for those of you who have never messed around with 10Ks, um, figure out how to find the 10K. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Be resourceful. Okay? It's not that hard. Find the 10K. Open the 10K. If I were you, I would just put word search. Uh, I would open the, the word search bar and type income tax. Okay? 
you start looking for income tax and eventually you'll get to stuff that says income tax. So uh, I kind of know my way around a 10K, so I'm just going to keep flipping until I hit the um, uh, audited financial statements. No 14. Yeah, that's true. Well, I don't want to go quite there yet. So I want to start probably here. Okay, so like I showed you on in the intro video, I would start by looking at the balance sheet and trying to see what they have for income taxes. And as I was highlighting in the, in the slides, you can see that they don't have a lot of tax accounts. Um, they don't have a lot of tax accounts here. And so you can see that they had... Um, d -d 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 yeah, current deferred tax asset, right? Like that could be bad debt reserve. You know, they're going to save two hundred and twenty million dollars in the future because something will happen that will cause a future deduction, and it's worth two hundred and twenty million bucks to them. That's all you can tell from their balance sheet. That's not much. So, but you would look, you know, see what you can find. If they had some gigantic deferred liability, you might be like, "What is that thing? When's that going to come due? Do they have cash to pay that?" Right? That kind of thing. So think with an open mind. Think, you know, open-ended questions. Don't ask Tracy yes/no questions. Right? Do you like your job? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know, you can ask her about you know. Tell me about a time when like you were worried about something going wrong, or what was that? And tell me more. You know, that's fine to ask those things too. But try to try to put them in the context of the financials. Why would you have the asset when the tax rate's thirty-five percent? I mean, their effective tax rate is thirty-nine percent. And they actually reconcile it out from 35 to 39. Those are basically it's, it's the state issue. So why would you have a why would you have a asset on the balance sheet? Should calling calling it up 200 and some odd thousand dollars, 200 and some odd. It, you already you're paying, already paying the max rate. Well, it'll just be timing differences. It'll be. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, so then, you know, you would look at their income statement, right? And I showed you on the video that their income tax expense was this 436 number here. So you look at that and say, oh, that's interesting. And I might look at all three years and see is something weird between the years, right? Which, with Nordstrom's, it's very, you know, smooth. Um, so there's nothing weird there. But I would look and say, sometimes you see a company that has a really high expense one year or really low expense, and you might be like, gosh, what's going on? I want to learn more about that. Um, but theirs looks pretty consistent. Do you also look at the comment letters the SEC gives out to the company? Um, not really, but you could. Because I think they're, they're, I think they're sort of a way. They're getting all their tax. The okay. SEC has asked a lot of comments about companies or given a lot of comments. Okay, so I started with balance sheet. I tried to figure out what are they showing on their balance sheet, and the answer is not much. I look on their income statement, it looks pretty straightforward, right? Next thing I would look at is the cash flow statement. Okay, one question I'll always ask you about a 10K is how much tax did the company pay in cash? Okay, and then the next question I'm going to ask you is why is that cash different than their expense? Okay. So when you look at their cash, they said, hey, we paid 398. And the year before that, we paid 381. So if you compare that to the pr provision, right? Well, they they paid a little less than they expensed this year, right? He, over here, they kind of paid about the same amount, right, as on the cash flow. So it's not wildly different, okay? But is that 2011 cash flow is that for 2010? Is that money that they paid out in 2011, but it relates to the prior year's tax return that they did a provision for? This cash flow statement, this column right here, would be 2011. This would be the cash that they paid in 2011 for taxes. For okay. So Susie's saying, well, is that taxes paid in 2011 for 2010 or 2011? I don't know. It doesn't say it, right? Just, no, it just says the year that they paid it. Right. And so now you have reached the like precipice of you don't have any more information. So you don't know. Okay. So what I, all I can ask is that you learn as much as you can. Right? When One of the homework assignments will be to read Amazon's 10K. And when you look at their provision, mm -hmm. so I will give you a hint. When you look at their provision, this, this will have a big number. Okay? When you look at their cash flow statement, 
it'll have a very small number. And the year before that, it'll be exactly the same. And the year before that, it'll be exactly the same. I think NetApps is like this too. Okay? So when you look at NetApps provision, you look at the cash taxes, totally different. Same reason every year. So there's okay? permanent stuff going on? So Susie's saying, is there a permanent difference? Uh, maybe. Um, it's more complicated than that. And you'll learn in a later class about it. But I want you to, to see it first, right? The, the, the challenge I want you to think about is not what's the answer. I want you to notice there's a difference. What is going on, right? You should be identifying things that seem weird. Because you should say, well, if I'm expensing a certain amount, I kind of think I will be paying it over time. So maybe in one year it's weird, but over three years, it's about, it should, probably should be evening out or something. But if you see like net apps, which I'm guessing, um, it will not even out. And so a good question for them would be, what's up? How come you're not paying any tax? Right? That would be a great question. And, and you would say, well, how come your expense is way up here and your payments are way down here? And that happens every year. What kind of like situation do you have that's causing that? Sales tax. <laughs> sales tax reserve is not the answer, but um, it's it has a lot to do with um, on getting rich. Okay, stock compensation causes that e effect. Um, but anyways, again, the answer is not important. The important thing is identify the situation, ask a question, be inquisitive. Okay. All right, so the next thing I would do is, um, and somebody mentioned that the tax footnote is in note 14. So if you spend any time with financial statements, you'll see there's always a bunch of notes behind the balance sheet income statement, cash flow. And you can always tell the importance of tax based on where they put the tax footnote. 14 isn't bad. 14 is about average. Uh, where'd it go? 14. Okay, so what you will find when you're reading a company's a tax footnote is that they all look kind of similar. Um, different but similar. Okay, and one of our classes that we're going to go through is going to be on disclosures. And we'll be around why does a company disclose what it discloses? The answer is because it has to. Okay, and there's rules for what you need to disclose. And so people follow the rules, they put in the same disclosures more or less. So the sooner you get familiar with them, the better. The first table that companies typically put in their financial statements is a table that explains their total expense, but they break it down between the current expense, meaning the expense related to taxes they owe this year, and the deferred expense, which has to do with the change in deferreds. Okay, and remember when I did that example three and I broke out the expense between the two, that's all they're doing. Okay. So you would look at Nordstrom and say, huh, looks like you pay your tax pretty current, not a lot going on with your deferreds, right? Their deferred line is like almost out of business. There's not much going on there. So that looks very simple, right? You say, gosh, you pay, you know, a 40% tax basically and you kind of cash pay it every year. That's what this looks like. The second table that you'll see companies put in their um, filings is what's called a rate reconciliation. And that rate reconciliation will explain what the effective tax rate is. So their, their effective tax rate is going to be 436 divided by their pre-tax income, which is going to be 39% for them. And they will tell you in this rate reconciliation, well, gosh, if I started with 35%, but I finished at 39, what is that for? Okay, they will tell you. And if it was Uncle Sam eating too much, then it would be a <laughs> there would be a line. See how I didn't ask, I just called you Uncle Sam. <laughs> Everything is on purpose. Okay. So the permanent difference there is it could be meals and entertainment, right? Everyone in Nordstrom's is eating a ton. It's non deductible. It's causing their tax to go up, right? They don't call it meals and entertainment, they call it permanent items or differences. But that could be what that is. It could be other things too could be a few things netting it against each other. It's hard to know. But that, if that was the problem causing their rate to go up, that you, you could see it from the schedule. Okay? So Amanda will be happy to see that they are paying state taxes. Right? So the reason that they have a tax rate north of 35 is because they pay a lot of state taxes. And remember that that 3.6, that's after the federal deduction. 
So 3.6 is more akin to like a 6% tax rate, which is a pretty high state tax rate for, especially compared to technology companies. Technology companies is like very tiny. But retail company that has a, like a brick and mortar type of situation, that would be standard. So these guys are about as simple as it gets, right? They pay federal tax, they pay some state tax, not a lot else going on. So your question to this, per, you know, the person in Nordstrom would be like, wow, your, your tax rate looks pretty predictable. You know, do you have low blood pressure? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do, they do have a funky thing going on here in 2009. And they say deferred tax adjustment. Okay. So again, you may not know what that is, but you should be able to look at that and be like, what is that? Right? Deferred tax adjustment. I thought I learned that deferred taxes don't impact my effective rate. And here they're explaining that your rate changed because of deferred taxes. All right? Anyone know what that is? Is that an IRS thing? Did they kind of settle? I don't know. Is that the sale of the, of the, uh, of the business? Mm, maybe. I think it's the 2009. He's trying to tell you right there in the sentence below. But see, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read it and think, what are they trying to tell me? And then ask Tracy, like, what are you telling me here, right? It's a little cryptic. Tell me more, right? That's what I want you to do in the exercise. So this could be simple. This could be, okay, that's a benefit, right? 1.8 is a bracketed number. It means the rate's going lower, okay? So let's say that, um, let's say that you had a bad debt reserve that's a future deduction, and the, and the tax rate went from 35%, you know, let's say Obama wins again, and he's like, ah, 45%, right? <laughs> so the tax rate goes up. So that $200 future deduction, that's no longer worth $70 to you, 35%. It's now worth $90 to you. That's great, right? It's great news the tax rate went up, at least with respect to that future deduction. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm trying to see, see how low that, but yeah, this is good. Right, so that deferred tax, you could have increased a deferred asset, which is a provision benefit, right? You've permanently saved more tax related to that 200 because tax rates went up. That could explain that, okay? That's obviously not the right facts, but it could be something like that. Or it could be something like, I completely forgot I even had a bad debt reserve DTA. I've been missing it all these years. Silly me, I should book that because I have that deduction and I didn't have it before. So I should correct that error that I made by not booking it before, I should book it now. Okay, so I found an asset out of this, uh, all of a sudden. Okay, that's bad, that's embarrassing. That may have nothing to do with what the real facts are, but it could be that, right? And so you can't tell necessarily unless there's something else in the, di in the narrative here, but that item on the rate rec should trigger your attention. Like, what is that, right? If, if you see something and you don't know what it is, form a question around it. Like, what is going on with that thing? So that entry there is possibly like a, a, the debit to the deferred tax asset and the credit to the provision, which may It's almost inevitably that, right? I mean, they're basically saying it affects the provision. That is why it's in the schedule. So that's one entry. And if they call it deferred tax adjustment, pretty good chance affecting deferred taxes. But that is unusual. You know, pick up 10 10Ks, you will see that zero times, maybe once. Okay, so the next table that will go into a company's disclosure is a table of deferreds. So these are all the temporary items, like if you were cheating on the feud and you wanted to say, what deferred items are common, right? We said deferred compensation, we said reserves. Um, what else did we say? Depreciation would be this one, right? So they have like three of the ones that were on our list. Deferred revenue is on there. Gift certificates, yeah, I mean, that's deferred revenue. So they have a lot of those types of things where book and tax differ, right? So in theory, if they sold their balance sheet for cash, they would save 343 million bucks, right? That's what that's trying to say. Okay, so you should look at that table and be like, what's going on with that table? What do they have that's weird, unusual, huge, tiny, right? Pretty much the last table that you will see is this thing called unrecognized tax benefits, which um, is a very um, under, hard to understand term, which basically means tax reserves, contingency taxes. This is what Amanda is looking for, right? 
this is um, a, a relatively new thing that companies have to do, where they have to say, at the beginning of the year, I reserved 43 million of taxes that I didn't voluntarily pay, but in my judgment, I might have to pay when I get audited. Okay, so, we, so this is an uncertain tax position that gave rise to a liability that I booked based on me anticipating I will have to pay more. Okay? No one wants to pay more. Tax law is gray in many cases, but this is a company saying, based on like everything I know, I think I might have to pay 43 more. That's as of the beginning of the year. And they said, during the year, I took positions on my return, which is causing me to book maybe another 14 of reserves. Right? I don't know why that ain't working very well. So they're saying, look, I took a position, like maybe I didn't file a return in state Y, but state Y, when they come find me, probably need to pay some tax. Right? That could be part of the 14. Um, they said there were positions in prior years of, this, of 14, which is probably a complete coincidence, although it was the same phenomenon last year, too that they said, you know what, we thought we were going to owe tax in prior years, but it turns out it didn't happen. Statute lapsed. Man, it didn't catch me. Good for me, right? Um, it could be that they decided their position was a winner. It could be decided that the statute lapsed. It could be that they settled with the uh, tax authority for way less than they thought they were going to have to pay. It could be any of those things. You don't know. But this is them telling you in a table how much tax they might still have to pay based on audit contingencies without giving you a ton of detail. This is giving you some idea of what's looming out there in terms of tax contingencies. So what's it, so they have an increase, and so a 21, so how's that book? Um, are they increasing their payable, or what's, what, is, what is that? The 21 is the amount at the end of the year that they still owe, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not the increase, it's the cumulative amount that they owe at the end of the year, okay? And so um, each row represents activity the bottom represents the ending balance. Okay, so that 21 is sitting somewhere in the balance sheet as a liability, and if all the tax authorities that they had exposure with came and audited them and came assessed them based on the company's judgment, they would have to cut a check for 21 million bucks. That's what that's trying to tell you. So if you find a company that has a huge reserve, your question might be, you guys are aggressive, how's that working out, right? Um, if you see a company as big as Nordstrom's that potentially only owes 21 million, that's chump change. Um, when you go look at the big pharma companies, you know, Glaxo, Merck, Pfizer, they all have like five to seven billion in that number. The, the pharmas are famous for like huge Fin48 amounts. And so um, it's kind of interesting. Like you can take, there was just an article in Tax Notes about somebody who took like the top hundred companies in these disclosures and it was a humongous number. It was like three hundred billion dollars or something that tax authorities would collect if everything was assessed just for 100 companies. And you're like, that's, I mean, these are huge companies, right? You have to research for the good government. It's like, okay, where's our hot list? Right, you're like, might want to audit Pfizer, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I'm guessing you guys talk about this stuff. I mean, this is very, it's not uh, secretive stuff, right? I mean, the FASB wanted you to be more transparent with readers, but tax authorities are like, this is helpful. Yeah, I mean, so if you were a company and you didn't want to attract the attention of tax authorities, you'd stop reserving, right? And there's a big debate out there in terms of whether this kind of disclosure is causing people to do different types of accounting, right? Because now you're giving yourself up. And the answer is it's totally true, right? It's like a Freakonomics type of thing, right? You just think of incentives and behavior. So the incentive here is, you know, you do something and there's an effect. Okay, but these Fortune, uh, whatever top companies, how often are they being audited by the IRS? Isn't there more focus on them? Um, sure, of course. So, I mean, the federal is definitely there, right? So when you see Tracy next week, you can cheat. Ask her. You can say, have you been audited? Yeah, just ask her. Right? They have a number in the table. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it's more than one. And uh, mm -hmm. you would think they might be a good candidate for an audit. So ask her, have you gotten audited? what was the result? Yeah, she'll tell you. I mean, sh but again, she'll tell you what's in the public domain, and uh, maybe you can figure out more just from reading their 10K. Okay. So then there's a bunch of uh, words, right? Um, so they tell you the settlement activity, right? Um, there's a line in here for settlements. That means they cut a check for 24 million bucks to get rid of some audits, right? So they say, we closed out our 08 IRS audit. Man, those guys got a bunch of money, right? 
um, and for state taxes. And you just read some of that stuff. You know, their disclosure is actually pretty darn short. Um, see what you can come up with. But that, if you read the balance sheet income statement, cash flow, tax footnote, and then just go through the document and word search for income tax, see what it says, try to get smarter, come up with intelligent questions, that's what we need to do. Risk factors. I mean, if you hit income tax and you go through, it'll bump into risk factors. Yes, there will be a lot of findings for the word income tax. Guarantee it. Okay. Um, the word gross increase and gross decrease is it really the same thing, or just the same? Um, Jesse's question uh, was whether gross increase, gross decrease uh, means anything. <coughs> Class three. Okay, so this video got way too long. Before, before you leave 